It is now time for oral questions. I'm pleased to recognize her leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. Uh, thanks so much. My first question this morning is uh, for the Premier. Speaker, our health care heroes, our small businesses who are trying to stay afloat, parents who are trying to drop their kids off at school continue to have to walk a gauntlet of hateful anti-vaxxer harassment. My question to the Premier is simple. Will he stop saying no and pass safety legislation, safety zone legislation today to protect them? To reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the member's question opposite. You know, I, I think we all appreciate and understand that we are disappointed when people choose to protest in front of our health care facilities. Uh, but to be clear, that is not happening a lot in the province of Ontario. And currently in the province of Ontario, police have the ability to intervene when appropriate. And those instances include, of course, harassment and intimidation. So I'm watching this very closely to make sure that we don't have situations where healthcare workers and individuals who are accessing our healthcare system being put at risk because of protesters. But right now, in the province of Ontario, currently there are opportunities and, and abilities for the police to intervene when appropriate. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thanks, thanks, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, the Premier has been dragged kicking and screaming uh, to, for example, call in the military to help in long-term care. Uh, he was dragged kicking and screaming to implement vaccine certificates. Uh, he is now uh, not doing what he should be doing when it comes to safety zone legislation, and we watched as he was dragged kicking and screaming to agree to rapid testing in hotspots and schools after several weeks after schools were already back. My question again is to the Premier, will he finally take decisive action? Stop saying no, do the right thing, and pass safety zone legislation today. General. I, I think it's important for the member opposite and others in the Assembly to appreciate and understand what tools already we have in the province of Ontario and the police have. So under the criminal code, police officers have an extensive number of tools in their authority. Some examples include mischief, interruption of lawful use of enjoyment of property, trespass, breach of the peace, assault, criminal ne negligence, and causing a disturbance. I know that when we see individuals protesting, we want them to come here to Queen's Park, here to the legislature. But it's also important to understand that healthcare workers are protected under existing legislation and existing tools that the police across Ontario have. I know that our healthcare leadership wants to keep their staff and their, the visitors to their hospital safe and will continue to do that using the existing tools we have. Thank you, Speaker. The final supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians are fed up with the Premier's hesitation to take on the anti-vaxxers, and they're tired of hearing him apologize to them. While he does nothing to protect our health care heroes and cancer patients trying to get into our hospitals, our parents who are simply trying to drop off the kids at school and they're being screamed at by these folks, small businesses and their customers, small businesses who are trying to stay afloat and customers who are trying to support those small businesses who are being targeted and harassed by these unruly mobs of people. The Premier needs to do the right thing here, Speaker. He needs to do the right thing and pass the safety zone legislation uh, that we tabled the other day so that Ontarians can go about all of the activities, Ontarians who have done the right thing, who have been vaccinated, who are trying to ensure that we fight uh, successfully against COVID-19. They're the ones that need this Premier's attention. They're the ones that he shouldn't be saying no to. Will he say yes and pass safety zone legislation? Members, please take their seats. And the Solicitor General.
Justice, and I, I appreciate the, that the member opposite is attempting to make this a larger issue than it is. Um, I will reinforce and remind people that currently in the province of Ontario, Order. intimidation is not allowed. We have the tools. The police in our jurisdictions have the police to enforce, to ensure that our health care workers are safe. I get it. I'm no happier than anyone else when I see um, protests happening in front of our schools or our hospitals. But we also have to appreciate the people have the right to share their opinion. I would prefer that they do it in the uh, centre of government in, here at Queen's Park. Having said that, when there is intimidation and harassment in, in front of our hospitals, then the police have the ability to act, and I know that our hospital leadership will ensure that their staff remain safe. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Speaker, my next question is for the Premier, but I think it's clear this government can do something about the problem that we see happening to too many uh, people going about their business in Ontario. But my question now is about uh, the 35 days that it's been now since seniors and kids in our province have been able to access uh, eye care. There are children who are literally now in school having trouble seeing the blackboard. There are seniors who are unable to renew their driver's license, which then, of course, makes them uh, less, um, less mobile, uh, less independent, because they can't get their glasses prescription renewed because the service isn't being funded by the government. I spoke to a, a mom, her name Beverly Murray, last week, whose teenage daughter uh, is literally suffering from eye pain and migraines, and she cannot get her daughter an appointment to have her vision and her, and her eyes looked after by their optometrist. So my question to the Premier is, why is he saying no? Why is he saying no and refusing, refusing to get us a fair deal and fund the optometry services that our kids and our seniors so desperately need and deserve? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And through you, Speaker, I would like to uh, advise the Leader of the Official Opposition that OHIP funded services continue to be funded by the province of Ontario. However, the many optometrists in the province, at the urging of the association, have chosen not to provide those services. We're very disappointed with that. We have been engaging in discussions with them, and we're ready to continue those discussions. But this is the problem is due to the fact that the Ontario Association of Optometrists refuses to go back to the independent mediator and adhere to their conditions in order for the mediation to resume. We are ready, willing, and able to go back to the table to discuss, but this is not something that the OAO is interested in doing, and it's especially concerning that they continue to tell the public that they are waiting for us to return to the mediation table, when in fact that is not the case. We as a government are ready to go back and resume those Response. discussions, but the Ontario Association of Automatrists is not. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I have to say that it's really um, interesting to see what's happened here in Ontario. First thing that happened was the Liberals delisting eye care services, uh, allowing, of course, seniors and kids, but then seriously underfunding those services for many, many, many years. And now this Premier is making it much, much worse by refusing to come to the table and negotiate a fair deal and refusing to properly fund eye care. Granted, the Liberals refused to do it for years and years as well, but the problem has Order. become worse under this government, and that is no way, Speaker, to govern. That is no way to govern. This government needs to get serious about cutting a deal, a deal that is fair. And my question to the Premier is, why does he continue to say Yes, to his buddies, to his developer buddies, to the big box stores, but say no when it comes to providing the necessary eye and vision care for our kids and our seniors. Mr. Health. 
Speaker. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to set the members of the uh, opposition uh, uh, to understand what the situation actually is, as well as the members of the public, because the situation is such that the optometrists have refused to come back to mediation. They're choosing to demand an outcome before we even get into negotiations. However, I also appreciate the chance to advise what has actually happened. The government is making a payment of $39 million into the accounts of optometrists who have provided those services, covering an account in, to cover what's happened in the past. And I totally agree that the optometrists were not treated fairly by the previous government. But we are paying the $39 million, recognizing that the same rate as what physicians would have received from 2011 to when their jail uh, expired to now what physicians would have received. That's how we calculated that $39 million. We've also offered to uh, an immediate OHIP fee increase of 8.48% retroactive to April 1, 2021, and to engage in further negotiations with the optometrists about their overhead costs because we have a responsibility to do that as we attempt to achieve a Thank you. Thank you. And the final supplementary. The government has a duty and a responsibility to negotiate, not dictate. They haven't figured that out yet, but that's their responsibility. This Premier is easily saying yes to his buddies, but he said no to students, teachers and parents last spring. He said no last summer to long-term care residents and their families who needed the government's help. And now we're seeing it again as he says no to our kids and our seniors who need to have vision care and deserve to have vision care here in our province. So my question to the Premier is, will he finally say yes, get back to the table and put proper funding in place and commit to negotiating a fair deal so that our kids and our seniors can get what they need in terms of their vision care. I'll ask the members to take their seat. Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, the short answer to your question is yes, we are ready, willing, and able to go back into mediation, but you can't negotiate when you're the only party at the table. We have said that we are ready to proceed the optometrists were ready to proceed to rectify their re very relevant concerns to deal with the back pay issue, to deal with an increase going forward, to deal with their overhead, and to have an ongoing monthly Order. discussion with them, which is something that is not done with every health care group. We want to remedy their complaints. We want to reach a, a deal with them, but they need to come back to the table. We are ready to go to the table. We have agreed to the mediator's request, but the Ontario Association of Optometrists has not. They're not our conditions. They're the mediator's conditions. We're asking them to please come back to the table so we actually can Response. negotiate. But you can't do that by yourself. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Medical exemptions for not getting the COVID-19 vaccine are very rare. Dr. Moore has said that uh, about one in five out of 100,000 Ontarians would be eligible for a medical exemption to the vaccine. Yet somehow, Speaker, two members of the PC government caucus both claim to have medical exemptions. It's statistically curious that two out of 70 members somehow have these medical exemptions. Dr. Moore says it's supposed to be very rare and that these exemptions will need a review province-wide. So the question to the Premier is, can the Premier help explain the statistical anomaly in his own caucus? To reply, the government house leader. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, uh, I'm not entirely certain what this has to do with government business, but uh, I'll say this, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Premier took uh, immediate action, uh, action to ensure that all members of this caucus uh, were, uh, were vaccinated uh, uh, and to ensure that uh, those that uh, had not received uh, their two uh, doses uh, presented a, a medical exemption. Mr. Speaker, of course, those exemptions are provided by uh, medical professionals. Uh, and uh, and we you know we have to assume that the medical professional providing this uh, this exemption has done so based on the, the guidance and recommendations of the chief medical officer of health. Exactly. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Ontarians should be getting vaccinated unless it's absolutely cleared with a medical exemption. And as Dr. Moore has stated, these exemptions are exceptionally rare. 
As we've all come to learn, one of the PC members, the former parliamentary assistant to the Attorney General, revealed to her House leader that she hadn't in fact been vaccinated, as she'd previously led on and misrepresented her vaccine status. Will the Premier be demanding that these exemptions be reviewed, or will he once again just be taking his members' claims at face value? To reply, the Premier. Well, th thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and, and thanks to Ontarians and the frontline healthcare workers, we have vaccinated over 22 million people in Ontario. We're one of the world leaders with 87% of eligible Ontarians vaccinated and 82% fully vaccinated. But I, I find it pretty rich when the, the leader of the NDP should recognize that considering her own position evolves day to day, depending on which way the wind blows, that's the decision the NDP leader. And I find it ironic that the Liberal Party, with only seven, seven caucus members, still can't figure out who's vaccinated or not. We were very transparent, Mr. Speaker, on the people that uh, had a medical exemption. Order. We don't get involved in people's personal medical Order. records, but we were very transparent. And again, it's Mr. Not. Speaker, I find it very rich that the NDP, uh, depends on the day, uh, can't tell us who's vaccinated and who's not. The next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, and good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. And firstly, I would like to congratulate the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, for his new appointment. The people of Ontario are very fortunate to have such a hardworking member at the helm of a very important government portfolio, and I look forward to seeing all of the continued work that you will be undertaking on behalf of the government for the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, our government is continuing to lead the country in driving down harmful emissions by expanding the availability and use of clean fuels. One such clean fuel that our government sees potential in is hydrogen. Could the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks share some details of the government's low-carbon hydrogen strategy? Thank Minister you, of the well. Environment, Conservation and Parks to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the tremendous member from flamborough granbrook for that excellent question. She's right. Ontario leads Canada in driving down GHG emissions and building a more sustainable future. We're doing that thanks to the leadership of this government, expanding renewables in clean fuels. That's the equivalent to taking the emissions of over 300,000 cars off the road. We're doing it through building subways, go service line, like we've never seen before in Ontario. When families are spending less time in gridlock, they're spending more time with their loved ones. And finally, thanks to the leadership of the Premier and the Minister of Economic Development, we've seen a historic renaissance in manufacturing, $6 billion in investments. Ontario is an EV powerhouse thanks to their work. But Mr. Speaker, one of the things I'm most excited about is hydrogen. It's a, it presents incredible potential. Ontario is again among the leader in Canada in establishing a hydrogen strategy working group. Work is underway to finalize the strategy, and with it, I'm confident that Ontario will be among the first movers in this space, leveraging our clean energy advantage and continuing to be a leader in Canada. Thank you, Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that explanation. Hydrogen appears to be a key to the government's plan to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but is something many Ontarians simply are unfamiliar with. Could the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks please share with me some of the interesting applications for hydrogen that our government is exploring? Great work. Minister of the Environment. Thank you uh, again to the, to the member for that great question. There are countless ways low-carbon hydrogen can be used in one's day-to-day -day lives. In communities, it can be blended into natural gas pipeline to heat our homes and our businesses. In industry, it can be used as a replacement for fossil fuels that are used in high-temperature applications like in the production of steel and cement. Imagine a building sector where these materials could be produced with minimal carbon emissions. And did you know that 80 percent of Ontario's 2018 greenhouse gas emissions came from transportation? Enter buses and trucks, fueled by low-carbon hydrogen. And I'd like to give a special shout-out to the incredible folks that I visited at Cummins in Mississauga, leaders in the exciting work they're doing for fuel cell technology. Our government will continue to fight climate change, Mr. Speaker, and build an Ontario where green, clean solutions thrive 
and prosper. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you. My question is to the Minister of Education. Eight provinces have signed on to the federal government's promise to roll out $10 a day childcare, but Ontario hasn't. Even though many parents in Ontario pay some of the highest childcare fees in Canada, upwards of $20,000 a year. Childcare has become so expensive that parents, mostly women, are giving up their careers or going part-time because they can't make it work. Women's participation in the workforce has dropped to a 30-year low. If this government is committed to equality for women and a strong economic recovery, then families need access to high-quality, affordable childcare. So this is my question. When is this government going to sign on and provide $10 a day childcare to help the parents and children who live in Ontario? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member opposite. I think what the member opposite and I could agree is that under the former Liberal government for 15 years, childcare rose the second highest in Canada, after the New Democratic province of BC, I should note. 40 per cent increase in childcare fees. That is simply unacceptable to the Premier and our government, making it inexcusably high in, uh, for many average families and middle-class people. It's why the first act the government took in our first budget was to introduce an Ontario child care tax credit to put money directly in the pockets of moms and dads, recognizing they are best positioned to make decisions with respect to their child's care. Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic, we enhanced that in the last budget. And yes, we are negotiating in good faith with the federal government to get a good deal, not any deal, a good deal for the people of Ontario that recognizes our unique advantages. We're one of the only provinces that funds all day kindergarten. So yes, we are working with the federal government, with the prime minister's office, with the minister uh, Ahmed Hussein to deliver a deal that provides affordability for families in this province. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is back to the Minister of Education. This is about childcare centres, because they are also struggling to survive during this pandemic. Many have seen a drop in enrolment because parents have lost work and are choosing to stay at home, and also because the fees are so expensive. Childcare centres have also had to bring on more staff in order to implement important infection control measures to keep children and staff safe. And many centres are now at risk of closure, many have cut staff hours, and many have closed. Our public and non-profit childcare centre is struggling when it should be thriving. So this is my question. What is your plan to ensure that every parent who needs a quality, non-profit or public childcare space for their child can get one? Mr. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Member Opposite, for the question. In fact, 99.67 per cent of child care centres are open in the province of Ontario today, in part because we have provided backstop funding to them to ensure they are open for the benefit of moms and dads so they can get back to work. Mr. Speaker, this government is investing $2 billion in building child care spaces, $2 billion to help ensure sustainable, quality and affordable child care. 30,000 childcare spaces is the commitment we made, 10,000 with the new schools, which we have undertaken in each and every budget to expand access to make life more affordable. We enrich the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit Week, that benefit providing a funding directly to parents' pockets, now $1,500 on average per child. That's going to make a difference. And working with the federal government, we hope to get a good deal that advances affordability, that makes childcare more accessible in all regions of Ontario. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Orleans. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, John in Orleans is in his 60s and he has cataracts. John relies on his optometrist to closely monitor this critical aspect of his health, and he's very concerned about his long term eye health without regular examinations. And John isn't alone. Uh, like I think everyone in this chamber, I've heard from thousands of constituents who support world class. OHIP covered eye care and are frustrated with the government's inaction to ensure its continued delivery. I've heard from moms like Andrea, who, like many parents, have risen to the challenge this year, juggling work, kids at home, maintaining a household, and keeping their family safe. And now that their kids are headed back to school, they can't get an eye test. She wants to ensure that her children are able to see the smart board and participate in extracurriculars they've been missing due to COVID. But due to the government's inaction, OHIP-covered eye exams have been non-existent for uh, about a month, basically since school came back, Mr. Speaker. And like so many other issues facing the government, 
They wait until the absolute last moment, until they've broken the system and chaos has ensued before they start to try to address the problem. So, Mr. Speaker, my question for the Premier. Question. When will the government take action on eye care? Now that they've broken it, when will they start to try to fix it? Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. In fact, I know that people like John and Andrea and thousands of people across the province are relying upon their optometrists to provide them with the care that they need, whether it's glasses for school or people with cataracts, seniors that have other eye care problems. That is why we are very disappointed that the OAO has walked away from the mediation table. We are ready, willing, and able to correct some of the problems that they have been experiencing um, uh, pursuant to the previous government. Their last agreement expired in 2011. I know that they are frustrated. We want to work with them. We want to bring them back to the table. But to date, they have refused to uh, agree to the conditions that have been put in place by the independent mediator, not by the government. We have agreed to those conditions. The optometrists have not. So we are very anxious to resume those discussions, but as I indicated earlier, you can't negotiate when there's only one party at the table. So I urge the optometrists to come back to the table. We are anxious to resolve your issues. We have put $39 million into your accounts that will be paid mid-October, but optometrists have already received the statements as to what they will be receiving. We urge them to come back to the table so we can reach an agreement that is satisfactory Response. to both the optometrists and to the taxpayers of Ontario because we have a financial responsibility there as well. But we are ready to discuss their concerns any Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplementary is for the Premier. For months, uh, optometrists were trying to engage the uh, government in meaningful discussions to address the eye care funding issues in the province, and the government simply said no. The government and this Premier like to say no, Mr. Speaker. The Premier said no to supporting workers with paid sick days. The Premier said no to vaccine certificates. The Premier said no to smaller class sizes. And now the Premier is saying no to OHIP-covered eye exams. Shireen in Orleans is a mother of four. Her kids need eye exams so that they can go back to school and see the, uh, see the board, but they're also suffering from headaches, and this eye exam is a critical aspect in diagnosing uh, that particular problem. She's tried to book an OHIP-covered eye exam for her kids, and she was told no, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, when will the Premier actually start saying yes? When will he say yes to OHIP-covered eye exams and sit Question. down and hammer out a deal to give Ontarians world-class eye care once again? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to, through you, Mr. Speaker, correct another fundamental misapprehension here. The government is still funding OHIP-covered eye services. However, the optometrists have chosen not to provide them. So the reason for this impasse lays at the feet of the optometrists at this point. They need to come back to the table to discuss this with us. We had had a numerous a number of discussions four months Order. before September Order. 1st, which was the date that they decided that they would refuse to supply these services. Those uh, we had several mediation efforts, which came to a delay or just to a, a standstill because the optometrists wanted us to agree to a foregone conclusion. We can't agree in advance to something that has to be negotiated. So we are ready, willing, and able to discuss this with them. We've said that for months and months. We Response. want to come to a conclusion with them to deal with their past issues, their present issues, and their future issues. So I would urge all of the members of the opposition to please discuss this with the Association of Optometrists, ask them to come back to the table. So Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. Order. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my question is for the Associate Minister for Digital Government. And I would like to be, I believe, the first in the House to congratulate him on his new appointment uh, to this uh, very, very important ministry. Our government has always focused on keeping the people of Ontario safe, and we have not wavered from that commitment through the entire COVID pandemic, Mr. Speaker. We will get through this health crisis. We will continue supporting Ontarians and businesses, and we will get the economy back on track. Could the minister please explain what our government is doing to help businesses operate safely 
and how that is working to support our economy. Recognize the Associate Minister for Digital Government. I would like to thank the member of Kitchener Conestoga for the question. Speaker, we know businesses have faced significant challenges over the past 18 months. That's why we are continuing to do everything in our power to provide businesses with the support, the stability they, they need and they deserve. And that's why, uh, Mr. Speaker, this month, our government will be delivering the enhanced vaccine certificate with a unique QR code and an accompanying free Verify app for businesses that can be downloaded from the Apple App Store and the Google uh, App Store onto a smartphone. Speaker, the app will allow businesses to quickly and easily scan QR codes so that they can determine if a person has received full vaccination or not and can enter the indoor establishment. The Made in Ontario app, Speaker, is the best option for businesses because it makes the vaccine verification process quicker, easier, and more secure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, I'd, I'd like to thank the, the Minister that, for that response and, of course, his commitment to developing tools that support the Ministry of Health's public health measures. Our government continues to urge every Ontarian to get vaccinated, and I'm happy to say that proof of vaccination policy has resulted in meaningful increases in the province vaccination rates. Over 82 per cent of eligible Ontarians are now vaccinated. And that, Mr. Speaker, is fantastic news. As we move forward with the next phase of the proof of vaccination policy, could the minister please explain how this QR code and verification app for businesses will work? The Associate Minister to respond again. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Speaker, vaccine certificates will help make sure certain higher risk businesses and settings remain safe. They will also help protect our hard-fought progress and avoid future lockdowns. Much like other leading digital jurisdictions, governments, we are building the verification app and plan to release it as open source software. It is transparent tech uh, speaker that can be continuously improved. But we want to stress that digital first doesn't mean digital only. On October 22nd, Ontarians will have the choice to download the QR code, enhanced vaccine certificate, or they can continue to use the print version. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Uh, Winchester Public School, uh, in my writing of Toronto Centre, uh, sits at the very top of the list of schools that are in dire need of repair in Toronto. In fact, the cost to repair the school is estimated at over $7 million for one school. The urgent repairs at Winchester include uh, water boilers that have passed their useful service life, parts of the roof and the foundation, and upgrades to the ventilation system, which we know is vital to preventing the spread of COVID-19 in our classrooms. For years, the Liberal government ignored these problems, uh, and now this government uh, is refusing to spend the money that our schools actually need to get into a good state of repair. When can students and education workers at Winchester Public School uh, expect to see actual action from this government uh, to tackle their $7 million repair backlog? To reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. I appreciate there are significant needs to remediate a backlog, a multi-billion dollar backlog we inherited from the former Liberal government. We recognize building new schools and renovating existing schools is critical. It's why we have now announced over a billion dollars of net new school builds in this province. We are going to be unveiling another half a billion dollar allocation to build additional schools, to renovate existing schools right across Ontario, here, of course, in Toronto and in rural and remote parts of the province as well. We're allocating $14 billion over the next decade to do that part of a long-term commitment to improve the learning facilities that our children are within. There's $750 million, for example, last year where we announced 50 new schools, including two joint new school projects. We approved 23 permanent additions and another $129 million to do that, and $56 million to build over 1,700 net new childcare spaces. The work continues. We Spons? will, of course, invest more to ensure our schools meet the needs of our kids today. Thank you. And the supplementary question. 
With all due respect to the minister, thank you, Speaker. With all due respect to the minister, I didn't hear him say that a single penny was coming to Winchester Public School in Toronto Centre, a school that sits at the very, very top of the uh, repair backlog in Toronto. Annette Carling is a grade seven uh, and eight teacher at Winchester, and she told the CBC in an article that the, I quote: "The windows are awful, and it gets really cold or it gets stifling hot. We can't breathe." These are critical issues. Um, and, and unhealthy in the best of times, let alone during a pandemic. We are in the fourth wave of this pandemic, and ensuring, students, ensuring that students are safe in their classrooms is an utmost responsibility and should be an utmost responsibility of this minister. Why isn't this government working to prevent outbreaks and fix the repairs and re fix the repair backlog in our school, specifically Winchester Public School in Toronto Centre? Mr. Education. Thank you, Speaker. We're proud that there's two million children learning today in school where they belong. The plan that we've unveiled has been endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. It aligns with the Ontario Science Table. It ensures $600 million of ventilation improvements within schools in Ontario, the deployment of 70,000 HEPA units to schools in Ontario. That school and all schools would have received a benefit and an enhancement to their ventilation as a consequence of our government's investment and improvement. Mr. Speaker, we know that the plan we've unveiled is helping to ensure that 84 per cent of Ontario schools have no active case at all. But we're not taking that for granted. The Chief Medical Officer of Health announced yesterday another tool in the toolkit to ensure we keep schools safe and keep them open. It's why we've announced a targeted deployment of rapid antigen testing to high-risk schools, in addition to the layered approach of masking, of distancing, of cleaning of schools, and of course, of ventilation improvements. Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to invest. We'll be announced forthcoming a new round of capital improvements so that we can improve the schools and the facilities that our kids learn in every day. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. And let's put some facts on the table. Independent third-party research shows that the operating cost to provide an eye exam in Ontario without doctor compensation is $75.51. In Manitoba, optometrists are reimbursed $77. In Quebec, $106. In Alberta, $137. But in Ontario, the Order. government pays $44 forcing optometrists to lose $30 for each OHIP eye exam they provide. It's not fair, it's not sustainable, and children and seniors are paying the price of inaction. Speaker, the previous government failed to fix this issue. The current government must fix it so seniors and children get the eye care they deserve. Will the Premier commit today to saying yes to eye exams and paying the full operating cost of OHIP eye exams in this province? And to reply, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I can certainly agree with you that the previous government did not address the concerns of optometrists, which is one reason why they are so concerned right now about reaching an agreement. Their last agreement expired in 2011. We have made payment into their account to cover that time period based at the same rate as a physician's rate of increase, which is what they asked for. We are ready, willing and able to sit down at the table and discuss their additional costs, uh, but some of the comparisons that they have provided to the public are, are, are not entirely accurate, particularly with respect to Manitoba, which makes payments every two years, not every year. So we're not comparing apples to apples in this situation. However, having said that, we are prepared and we are continuing to fund OHIP operated services, pay it for services for children and seniors. Response. But we want to sit back at the table with the optometrists to discuss their additional costs, and I'll have more to say that about that in the supplemental. The supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect to the minister, this is about simple math not magical math. The $39 million basically equals out to an extra dollar per exam over the last decade, still meaning that optometrists are losing around $30 for each exam. The proposal the government has on the table increases compensation from around $44 to $48, meaning they're still losing $27 per exam. Like, what business can survive if they're losing money on every exam they offered. 
No other health care service is said, hey, you know what? To keep the lights on or to pay for staff or maybe to pay for the heating, you have to do that out of your pocket because we are not going to cover it. Speaker, it's just wrong. It is wrong, and it's letting down seniors and children who need access Question. to critical eye care, which is health care. So will the government at least to commit to covering the operating costs, not even compensating the doctors, covering the operating costs of eye exams in this province? Minister of Health. Uh, once again, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to correct a f another fundamental misapprehension with respect to the $39 million that's being paid into the accounts of optometrists. It's not being paid pro rata to every single optometrist in the program. It's not another dollar and fifty, whatever it is that is being suggested. It's actually a payment to cover them for the OHIP-funded services that they provided during that time period. Very significant difference. In fact, there are some optometrists that will be receiving over $100,000 as a result of just this one payment. However, we're not not suggesting that that should be the only payment. We don't expect optometrists to pay out of pocket for the services that they provide. We are prepared to pay the $39 million in back payments, 8.48 per cent going forward, retroactive to April 1st of this year, Response. and then to enter into an agreement with them to talk about their operating costs. We are willing to look at their overhead costs, but we can't just write a blank check. We have to do our Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there have been concerns raised in my community around vaccine hesitancy and how to encourage younger Ontarians, particularly those born in 2009 who have lower vaccination rates, to get the information they need to feel comfortable getting vaccinated. I know the best way to protect ourselves and our communities <clears throat> is to get as many Ontarians as possible to come forward and roll up their sleeves. It's clear that our government has had one of the most successful immunization campaigns in the country, with over 86% of Ontarians over 12 having at least one dose and 81% of Ontarians being fully vaccinated. We've made great progress, Mr. Speaker, but are still seeing significant vaccine hesitancy among younger age groups. And so on behalf of my constituents of Carleton, I want to ask what our government is doing to help address this concern and what supports are available for youth looking to get vaccinated. Great thank question. you. Great question. Minister Hill. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Carleton for this very important question and for the great work you do on behalf of your constituents every day. Our government has had one of the most successful vaccination campaigns in the country. As the member mentioned to date, we have administered over 21 million doses, more than any other province or territory. This means over 86% of Ontarians aged 12 and over are benefiting from a first dose of uh, immunization, and more than 81% are fully immunized. But we're not finished. According to the science table's latest modeling, unvaccinated people have a seven times higher risk of symptomatic COVID-19 disease, a 25 times higher risk of being in hospital, and 60 times higher risk of being in the ICU compared to people who are fully vaccinated. Because of this, we are continuing our last mile strategy to reach eligible individuals who have yet to receive either a first or second dose. To support this last mile strategy, the province and public health units are focusing on smaller, community-based and easy-to-access settings for vaccinations, like hosting clinics close to schools and at community centres. In addition, we worked with SickKids Hospital to create a hotline for families to call to ask health care professionals Once. about any questions or concerns they have concerning vaccines for youth. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response and all the work she has done this past uh, year and a half to support Ontarians during this pandemic. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I know that my constituents and all Ontarians will be very happy to hear about the specific initiatives we are taking to make vaccines more accessible to youth. I often receive questions about what is being done to support a more community-based approach in the last mile strategy. I was happy to see that Ottawa Public Health created their own VAXO bus after the success of the GoVax bus initiative. Uh, my question to the minister is, could you please elaborate on some of the specific initiatives included in the government's last mile strategy? Thank you. Minister Kahn. 
Yes, of course. Our government is working with public health units to target areas with low vaccination rates, as identified by postal codes, to support localized vaccination strategies, as well as targeted marketing by the province in these areas. Our strategy does include mobile clinics like the GoVax buses and community-based pop-ups, dedicated clinic days for families with people with disabilities, and town hall meetings in multiple languages. In fact, just last weekend, the GoVax buses attended several sites, including the Caledonia Fair, Islamic Society of North America in Mississauga, Midland Marina, the Listowel Fair, the Markham Fair, and the Lang Pioneer Village Museum in Keene, Ontario. Additionally, the buses will be parked at several college and university campuses, as well as GO stations this week. So, Speaker, to ensure maximum Response. protection against COVID-19 and the Delta variant, I encourage all Ontarians to please attend these sites to get your vaccination as soon as possible. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ottawa's light rail transit, our LRT system, is off the rails, Speaker, literally and figuratively. On September 19th, the Confederation Line train derailed, damaging both the car and the track. Thankfully, no one was injured, but the entire system has been disabled for three weeks, and no data has been provided yet as to when we can expect a resumption of service. Order. Speaker, I'm frustrated, Order. and so are people at home. Stop the clock. The Minister of Heritage will come to order. The member for Ottawa, Orléans, will come to order. Neither of you have the floor. I apologize to the member for Ottawa Centre. Please restart the clock. That's okay. Speaker. You have it's the floor. Used to ambient noise. But my point is, <laughs> people at home are upset. They're upset because this derailment is just the latest in a long string of failures. Speaker, doors that don't work wheels that go flat, uh, latest awful stenches in some of the tunnels. The province paid, Speaker, $600,000 for phase one of this LRT, and it's paid $1.2 billion for phase two. So we as a province can't just pass the buck to the city of Ottawa. We have an interest in this. So I'm asking the Premier and the government, will you join us today, will you join me today in asking the Auditor General to investigate Infrastructure Ontario's role and bottom lining the procurement of this project so we can get to the bottom of this mess. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And I appreciate that this is a very frustrating situation for the people of Ottawa and transit, while a priority for our province, it has to be done right. And we're well aware of these municipally-led projects, and, and the city is responsible for the procurement that has gone off the rails here in Ottawa, Speaker. But we're going to do our part. We're going to work with the federal government. We're going to work with the city of Ottawa. Those discussions with Mayor Watson are ongoing. And it's despite the, you know, the member who sits in this chamber from Orleans, who was part of this process, Speaker, we will continue to fix the mess. We will fix the mess of those Liberals who were sitting in this chamber and were elsewhere, Speaker. Order. We're going to make sure we help the people of Ottawa and get the LRT project back on the rails. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. I'm just going to invite my friend opposite to take some responsibility because it was this government that made sure the contract was signed. It was this government that made sure Infrastructure Ontario bottom lined the procurement of this project, which was a public private partnership, Speaker. It's Order. the same development model this government is promoting. In Stop the clock. Okay. The member for Carleton will come to order. The member for Flamborough Glanbrook will come to order. Please restart the clock. Remember, it's, okay, Senator, it's not clock. like the screeching of the wheels of a broken LRT that I hear over there. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, Liberal and Conservative governments have embraced this public-private partnership model. But do you know what it means to the people of Ottawa, Speaker, in practice? I'm going to caution the member on his language. Please conclude your question. Thank you, Speaker. Do you know what public-private partnerships means to Ottawa in practice? It means the public pays the price for failure. Infrastructure Ontario acted as an underwriter and an advisor to the City of Ottawa in this procurement project. The Auditor General should use the full powers of her office to investigate this matter. It's about value for dollars for Ontario citizens. Will the government join me today, join us today, in asking the Auditor General to investigate this mess to make sure we get the LRT in Ottawa right? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker. 
There's no question that improving public transit is a priority of this government. And that's why when it came to the Ottawa LRT, this government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, committed $1.8 billion for the project between phases one and two. But, Speaker, it is crucial to note that this is a municipally run project, and the procurement of this project is the responsibility of the City of Ottawa. Perhaps we should ask the former City of uh, Ottawa Transit Commission, the chair who sits in this seat today, and the member from Orleans on what went wrong, Speaker, because this government did its part, it's going to continue to do its part, and invest in public transit in Ottawa and across this entire province. The next question. The member for Scarborough Guildwood. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Throughout this pandemic, my community of Scarborough Guildwood has been a hotspot for COVID 19. And my question is to the Minister of Education. This government lacks a proactive planning, lack of proactive planning has put people at great risk. I co-hosted an education town hall last week, and one of my constituents, Dave, shared the story of his daughter's class sizes increasing despite the fact that they're supposed to be safely distancing. And the reason given was budget restraints. This despite the FAO reporting today that the education sector has actually uh, unspent $2 billion. You are, take, are not taking the steps to make sure that there is safety in our schools. Why are classes getting larger? Why is there no rapid testing in schools from the start of the school year? This government's pattern of delay has been costly for all of us. And your constant flip-flopping on rapid testing does not provide clarity to parents. So, Speaker, will there be enough rapid tests for every student in Scarborough? And how much longer do parents like Dave have to wait? I remind members to make their comments through the chair, the Minister of Education, to respond. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to quote the Chief Medical Officer of Health, who I think the member opposite, and I would agree, is an authority on school safety and on transmission in Ontario. He said, and I quote, I hope the parents can understand that our schools are remaining safe. We've got excellent protocols in place, and the addition of testing strategy, asymptomatic testing strategy, will only further build confidence and support our, our school system. If you compare us to any other province, we're keeping our schools open, we're keeping our schools safe, we're minimizing the disruption in schools, uh, and we will build an asymptomatic testing strategy for test and stay and surveillance. Our risk of infection remains relatively low in Ontario as compared to other jurisdictions in North America, and that's because our system is working." End quote. Mr. Speaker, we put in a layered approach that is aligned with the best medical expertise of the Ontario Science Table, who opposes a province-wide, broad-based asymptomatic testing program, but supports a targeted Response. approach, which is exactly what the government has adopted as another tool in the toolbox to keep schools safe, to keep them open, and to keep our kids learning. Thank you, Speaker. The supplementary question. Speaker, back to the minister. Why is this minister ignoring the fact that a third of all COVID cases are in schools? Speaker, we know that vaccines are the best way to beat COVID-19, yet this government refuses to mandate COVID vaccines for in-person learning and is still willing to pack more than 30 students in a classroom. Over 25% of eligible students are yet to receive their second dose, and we know that children between the ages of 5 and 11 will soon be able to receive their vaccine. However, like many places in this province and in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood, we have many parents who must work multiple jobs at extensive hours and cannot take their young ones to get their jab. So, Speaker, my question to this minister and this government, will you question. provide a plan and funding to schools so that those children 5 to 11 can get a coordinated way to receive their vaccines, or will you delay and keep them waiting again? Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. Um, I think when it comes to the immunization of citizens, we should not politicize this. We should celebrate, as parliamentarians, the fact that this province has one of the highest rates of immunization in this country, one of the highest rates of immunization for young people in Canada, and yet juxtaposed against one of the lowest case rates in Canada. We're proud of that. We should all be proud of that. That has been because, in part, of the leadership of our medical frontline staff, our teachers, I think parents and students who are leading by example. Speaker, we have put in place 300.
$186 million, $183 million for the second year in a row to ensure class sizes can be, uh, to ensure distancing within our classes, to ensure that our schools are safe. But in addition to that funding allocation, we have stepped up the air ventilation, an additional $600 million, over 2,000 projects, 70,000 HEPA units within every school in Ontario, including in every kindergarten class and in the schools within our respective communities that regrettably do not have mechanical ventilation, while we are fixing that, we have put a HEP unit in every single learning space, every gym, every classroom, every library, every tech lab. We're doing that because the Ontario Science Table and leading pediatric experts have said that is the way to keep our schools safe. That is Response. exactly what we're doing in consultation with the Deputy Premier to ensure students are safe, schools are open, and kids continue to learn. And the next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atta Koken. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. I was contacted last month by constituent Merritt O'Higgins Human. Her husband had a serious medical condition, and Merritt had to jump through hoops, calling everyone she could think of to try to get a family doctor. But it shouldn't have taken all that effort, especially for someone who has a very serious medical condition. Too many people in Northern Ontario can't find a family doctor accepting new patients. This government had three years to solve this issue. What is this government doing to make sure everyone who needs a doctor can get one? To respond on behalf of the government, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much uh, to the member for the question. This is a concern for many people in different parts of Ontario, particularly northern Ontario and in some cases rural Ontario. We have been working uh, very hard to increase the number of family physicians. That has been increased, more people working in teams as well. But uh, there are some situations where they have uh, virtual teams. I would uh, call the uh, the Renfrew virtual triage uh, unit one that does provide those services where people, if they don't have a family doctor can call into this service. They can then be treated by triage by the appropriate medical person, either online, uh, virtually, or in-person visits. So there are uh, different um, modalities that we are using now in situations where we uh, don't have a, a large number of family physicians. And I think that with the advances that we've made in virtual care and technology, that will be one additional tool that we can use in areas that are under Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the minister. Then, uh, I agree. The doctor shortage in Ontario, especially in rural and northern Ontario, is nothing new. But, and the Northern Ontario School of Medicine estimates that we're going to need 300 doctors uh, immediately, and that is not accounting for the retirements that are coming up. The pandemic revealed what so many people knew all along that. Healthcare was in crisis, and for far too long, it's been underfunded, and people have slipped through the cracks. People do not have access to primary health care. Too many people need a doctor but cannot find one, and none of them are taking new patients. We can't allow this to continue. Will this government commit to providing a family doctor for each person who needs one? Mr. Hill. Well, what I can certainly indicate to the member opposite for raising a very legitimate concern that we are listening to what the Northern Ontario School of Medicine is advising. We are moving forward to provide that kind of integrated care that people across Ontario require. That is why we have started on the transformation of our entire health care system to make sure that within geographic regions we have Ontario health teams. Ontario health teams are there to integrate primary care with hospital care, with home and community care, and long-term care to make sure that people have the supports that they need throughout their entire health care journey. The, we have seen the benefit of these teams throughout this pandemic because the teams have come together to fill in the gaps in service, to make sure that people receive the care that they need. And we're also trying to deal with the social Response. determinants of health, which we have said that we wanted to deal with for a number of years, but haven't actually really done yet. We can do it through the local Ontario health teams by bringing in the social service agencies to be part of these teams to make sure that people receive that all. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. Back in July, the Premier promised that we were not going to have a two-tier society. 
Eight weeks later, the Premier was announcing a two-tier passport system that is denying millions in Ontario the ability, ability to access services, including public services paid for by the taxpayer, facilities, and in many cases is resulting in people losing their jobs. Upon announcing the passport, the Minister of Health instructed facility operators to call the police to enforce the passport. And sure enough, in a couple of weeks, that's what happened. Does the Premier defend the idea of using police services to enforce passport rules and arrest hockey moms as a good use of taxpayer dollars? And to respond, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, as we've said from the beginning when we introduced the uh, vaccine certificates, it was to ensure that we had safe workplaces, safe community centres, safe opportunities for our children and ourselves to be able to start to slowly but safely gather inside. The vaccine certificate does just that. We are asking people to be respectful of the fact that when uh, business operators, when uh, municipalities ask for proof of vaccines, that people do that and they do it respectfully. There are so many people who have worked so hard to get us to this point where we are over 80% vaccinated, we need to go the final mile to make sure that we protect everyone. And yes, that includes parents and individuals who want to use our public facilities and participate in sports and other activities inside. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the government mentions health and safety. What's interesting is the new passport regulations from this government do not make any allowances for those who can show a negative COVID test. Millions in Ontario, vaccinated and unvaccinated, do not wish to participate in this witch hunt, forcing them to disclose their private health information. Let me give you an example. On Monday, I was the only MPP to access this legislative chamber with a negative COVID test. But some in here still wanted me expelled, even though the science shows you could all be carrying and spreading COVID while the test shows that I was not. If this is all about health and safety, why doesn't the government allow for Ontarians to access facilities and keep their jobs by showing a negative COVID test or showing immunity to COVID, as has been done in other jurisdictions? And to respond, the government house leader. Well, I, th I thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, uh, obvious, uh, obviously, the protocol was put in place uh, here in the Legislative Assembly to ensure that uh, all members uh, uh, could uh, have a, a safe working uh, environment, as the minister of health has said on numerous occasions, we do encourage everybody to get uh, vaccinated. It is the best way to protect the people of the province of Ontario. Uh, but again, it is, uh, uh, does respect the fact that uh, members of parliament have a right to access uh, uh, the precinct. That is a right that we were not uh, prepared to take away from the people of the province of Ontario. I think the protocols that are from the members who are elected to this place, excuse me, uh, I think it is a protocol that the Speaker uh, put in place with the support of, uh, of, uh, of members, most of the members of uh, this House, and as the member highlighted in her, uh, in her question, Mr. Speaker, she was granted that access that she has a right to have in this place by virtue of a negative test. So we've protected that, or I should say that the Speaker has protected that right for all members of Parliament, uh, and uh, I'm grateful for the Speaker for allowing that uh, precedent to continue on. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period. Point of order? Yes. The Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries has a point of order. Thank you very much, Speaker. I know that we had a lengthy uh, debate earlier today about what a relevant point of order is, but there are a number of members in this legislature today that are celebrating 10 years for being elected. The Associate Minister for Women's Issues, uh, the Minister of Economic Development and Trade, as well as the, the member opposite of my tourism critic, uh, Michael Mantha from Manitou Algoma, Manitoulin. I'd like to wish them, uh, as I know all members would, a happy 10-year anniversary in this esteemed place. Thank you. Congratulations to all of you. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 101C, changes have been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Ms. Fife assumes ballot item number three, and Madame Jelena assumes ballot item number 69, and Ms. Morrison assumes ballot item number 23, and Mr. Hatfield assumes ballot item number 64. There being no further business at this time, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m. <laughs>